Chapter 1, Mean Variance Portfolio Theory, Set Number 3. We have two methods to measure the portfolio risk. First, as an easier way, we just compute portfolio level returns for each scenario. Then, we compute the mean and standard deviation for the constructed portfolio. Second, we can also use the covariance matrix. The two methods generate the same answer anyway. In the following slides, I'm going to present the method based on covariance matrix. Let's compute the variance of portfolio. Suppose we have three risky assets, A, B, and C. Let me introduce some background for the covariance matrix. Let's say there are the best potential employees in the job market. That means I can have the best finance person, best person in the operation area, and another best person in the marketing area. By having the best employees A, B, and C, I expect I can make it the best company. I'm missing here a very important thing because I only assume the quality of the work from A and B and C individually, but I didn't expect anything that can happen between A and B, B and C, and C and A. Let's say there is some problem between employees A and B. For some reason, these two employees produce poor work together. And finally, this created a problem to the company. The risk jointly caused by employees A and B is called co-risk or covariance. When we estimate the performance and the overall risk from three components A, B, and C, we should consider individual risk A, B, or C, and plus, more importantly, those combinations from A, B, and C, which are A and B, B and C, or C and A. That means three components created nine different risks that need to be incorporated all together. Suppose you have three risky securities which create nine cells again. The diagonal of the matrix represents the variance of individual security. For example, for the first security A, the covariance between A and A should be variance of A. The covariance formula, as you see, is the combination of probability with a deviation from the expected value and another deviation from the second component. But in this case, we have two identical components, which is A. The numbers in two brackets are the same, and we can combine into 1 with the power of 2. And we all know the formula with the probability and the deviation, which is squared deviation, simply varies. And thus, the covariance on the diagonal should be the variances. 
How about other components such as A and B? Covariance A and B is the sum of probability for each time, for each case, with a deviation in the first component A, another deviation from the second component. However, it is exactly the same as the probability times the second deviation and the first deviation as A times B is equal to B times A. That means the covariance A and B should be same as covariance B and A. Let's rewrite the matrix. The risk from the portfolio should depend on the size of investment on each asset. If we made a huge investment on the first asset A, the portfolio risk should be affected more by this investment. On the diagonal, we include variance instead of covariance. For covariance A and B versus B and A, we only use A and B. A and C and C and A becomes the same. B and C, C and B become one covariance, B and C. We now include all these nine cells together into one formula. Take each of the covariance in the matrix and multiply by the weight at the top of the column and by weight at the left side of the row. For example, in the case of covariance A and B, we have weight for A, we have another weight for B, which should be combined for covariance A and B. So we have WA, WB, and covariance A and B. So we repeat eight other times for other cells. Finally, we will have WA squared for variance A, WB squared for variance B, WC squared variance C, and we have two WA, WB covariance A and B. One from here, the other one from here. Same for covariances A and C or B and C. So we have two WA, WC covariance A and C. And finally, we have two WB, WC with the covariance B and C. What if we have two assets instead of three assets? This will make the variance of portfolio much simpler. Since we have only A and B, anything with C from the previous formula will be excluded. So we have A's own risk, B's own risk, and the covariance between A and B. In that case, the variance of the portfolio, P, should be WA squared times variance A, WB squared times variance of B, and two covariance with WA and WB. Correlation is the standardized covariance. So correlation is covariance divided by standard deviation of A and standard deviation of B. Or covariance is correlation times two individual standard deviations.
instead of covariance, we can use correlation. Then we include standard deviation A and standard deviation B. You have seen this formula many places, including investment. Again, portfolio variance should include each component own risk with correlation or co-variance at the end. Our main goal is to reduce the variance of the portfolio. All the component in the formula squared and also the weight of investment is positive unless you make a short selling. Covariance or correlations are the only numbers that could be negative. This is why we pursue a negative correlation or at least small positive correlation to lower the size of the variance of a portfolio. So, the variance of portfolio for two assets again will have two variance and covariance with weight on each column and row, which will be again the first weight squared times the first asset variance and two covariance with the second conference weight squared and the variance of that asset and two variances could be combined into one. The portfolio's risk standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance, reduces as the number of assets in the portfolio increases, but there is a certain amount of risk that always exists. We call this market risk. That means no matter how many stocks we have or what types of portfolios we have, we all get the same amount of the risk from the market. Let's say Federal Reserve just announced the huge changes in interest rate. This will affect the whole market and their investment will be influenced by the risk. So our job in the field is to reduce the other portion of the risk which is idiosyncratic risk. As you see, most idiosyncratic risk is gone after the number goes beyond 12 or 13. If you construct a portfolio with well diversified assets, you can eliminate the unsystematic portion of the risk. This is why typical mutual funds include 20 or 30 stocks in their portfolio. We now examine covariance between two portfolios. Remember, the calculation we had before was on two assets. What if we have two portfolios and make a bigger portfolio? Since each portfolio includes two individual assets, the weight of investment in the portfolio A should be different from the weight of investment in portfolio B. The variance of first individual assets will be changed by 
how much the first portfolio A includes and other portfolio B invest. Same for the second asset. It depends on how much each portfolio invest on that asset. And also, the covariance between two assets will be affected by two portfolios investment. To show that this matrix result is the same as the traditional definition, we begin with the usual covariance equation. Covariance between portfolio A and portfolio B is expected value of deviation from the first portfolio and another deviation from the second portfolio. In the first portfolio A, we have two investments X and Y with a weight 1 and 2. In the second portfolio B, we also invest the same assets X and Y with a weight W1B and WB2. And then we include the right side equation into RA or RB we'll have each component with the weight and then we combine into W1 and W2 same for the second portfolio and the first investment will be combined into the variance with two different weight W1A and W1B and second investment combined into the variance with two different weights again. And now we have two covariance and the final equation we have here is same as what we had in the previous slide. We have a good application in which we allocate our investment between one risky asset and one risk-free asset. Asset allocation, by definition, is a portfolio choice among broad investment classes. In our analysis, the complete asset C will include risky asset P portfolio N plus risk-free asset F. Risky assets include any asset that incur risk. Risk-free asset is usually measured by T-bills, but other money market funds such as CDs and commercial papers can be included. Let's construct a portfolio by splitting $10,000 into safe and risky assets. So we invest $2,500 on treasury bill and the other $7,500 are going to three stocks A, B, and C. The expected return on risk-free asset is 5% and it doesn't have any risk. On the other hand, the risky assets expect a higher return 14%, but it incurs much higher standard deviation, 22%. First, the expected return of the portfolio is the weighted average between two assets. And the standard deviation for the portfolio is the big square root of the variance. Again, we have the first variance and second variance and two correlation with two standard deviations. Since we have one risk-free asset, we can eliminate the second and third portions 
Finally, the standard deviation for the portfolio is simply a times standard deviation of risky asset. If we don't invest on the risky asset, which means the proportion of that investment A is zero, we expect the same return as the risk-free asset, which is 5%. Of course, there is no risk at all. If we invest all money on the risky asset, we expect the same numbers that the risky assets have. If we split the money half and half, we are expecting the numbers in the middle. If we invest more on the risky asset, the average will be close to the numbers of risky asset. What if there is an investor who wishes a return higher than the maximized return 14%. This person must invest more. Remember, each investor had $10,000 to invest. In this case, the investor must invest 50% more than the seed money. So the proportion of investment in stock fund in the risky asset is going to be 1.5. In this case, the investor expects a much higher return, which is 18.5%, but the level of risk also increases. So this graph shows the asset allocation we discussed in the previous slide. Depending on what proportion we choose, we expect a different return and face corresponding risk. Once you connect all the combinations together, the line we have here, which is called the capital allocation line, shows an upward trend. The investors between 0 and 1 need to purchase treasury bills or money market instrument and their money will be used for lending. Any investors whose proportion is greater than 1 need to borrow some additional money to invest more. Investors want higher return but lower risk. So their utility curves or indifference curve shape this way. Therefore, the curves higher and to the left are preferred. Let's have three investors. Each investor will have indifference curves. The risk averse person will show indifference curves in the left side. The risk lover has indifference curves on the right side. The second investor has indifference curves in the middle side. For the second investor, the first indifference curve should be ignored because the investor can achieve the highest utility at this point. There is higher indifference curve, but there is no asset that provides that high return for the given risk. The investors will choose the second indifference curve to achieve that highest available utility. Two other investors will choose their own best allocation given their indifference curves. The first investor lend all money $10,000 at the risk-free rate. The second investor lend $2,500 at the risk-free rate and invest 
$7,500 on the risky asset. The third investor need to borrow $5,000 at the risk-free rate and add the money to the risky portfolio. In the following set, number four, we will discuss more details about the asset allocation. As you will learn, we have two major steps to construct a complete portfolio to achieve the highest level of utility.